Psalm 127. We're going to deviate from our series in Romans this morning. And I, I do things on an individual basis when it comes to special days. Um, sometimes on Mother's Day, I, I uh, might preach a Mother's Day oriented message. Um, other times I might continue on in the series and initially I was uh, planning to continue in Romans and then really the Lord brought uh, some other thoughts to my mind as far as the uh, leading of what to do this morning and when you find Psalm 127 please stand with me for the reading of God's word if you're able Psalm 127 Verses 3 through 5. Psalm 127, verses 3 through 5. The Bible says, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. And the message this morning is the blessing of motherhood, the blessing of motherhood. And a lot of what prompted me to um, preach a message pertaining to Mother's Day is that there are a lot of mentalities, a lot of philosophies that pervade our culture that are opposite to what the Bible says in regard to motherhood and to children. And so today's purpose is to both, one, encourage the mothers into how important and what a blessing motherhood is, because there's times, you know, particularly now we have mothers of all ages here, so you might not have children in the house anymore, but if you have children in the house, uh, that uh, there are times you do not feel like motherhood is a blessing, um, and it's to remind you that it is a blessing, and then for the rest of us, it's to have the right biblical perspective on motherhood so then we can be an encouragement to others and teach others the right things because they're getting an opposite in a large part getting an opposite message from the culture now the world they'll say happy mother's day but then a lot of the philosophies that are being espoused the rest of the year are not um, emphasizing the importance of motherhood and uh, so that's the really the purpose of the message this morning let's pray heavenly father thank you for your word and for the blessings of parenthood for whether it's mothers and fathers uh, thank you for the blessing of children and Lord we just pray that you would help us today in this time that there be encouragement challenge and help where needed and may you be honored and glorified in Jesus name amen you may be seated uh, some uh, facts about mother mothers um, these these are what I found and so I didn't look at these, I didn't look these up myself. I just found a list. So if any of them are wrong, don't blame me. Um, but I think they're right. At least they were right when they were written. Uh, the, the mother who gives birth to the largest baby on earth is a, is a mother elephant. After enduring 22 months of pregnancy, she gives birth to a blind 200 pound calf. So anybody want to have... 22 months of uh, carrying a child. <laughs> uh, the mother orangutan never puts her babies down and typically nurses them for six or seven years, which is the longest mother-child nursing dependence of any animal on earth. Americans spend $14.6 billion on gifts on Mother's Day, including $671 million on cards and $1.9 billion on flowers. $1.9 billion on flowers. Wow. On. What's that? That's, that's a lot of mothers. Approximately 800 women, either that or flowers are getting more expensive. I don't know. <laughs> um, a lot of, there are a lot of mothers. Uh, approximately 800 women die each day from pregnancy-related causes during pregnancy, childbirth, and postpartum around the world. Of the 287,000 annual deaths that occur in developing countries, 56% occur in sub-Saharan Africa with another 29% in South Asia. The oldest mother in modern history to give birth is Rajo, Rajo Devi Lohan from India. She was 70 years old in 2008 when she gave birth to a baby girl following a controversial IVF treatment. Um, who would want to do that? I mean, you must really want children. 
if you're 70 years old and you're yeah, that's that's true. Man. I want to be the oldest. Yeah, let me do, let me just do this. Forget the child. Let me do the. Uh, Bobby McCaughey from Iowa gave birth to the most surviving children from a single birth in 1997. She had the first surviving set of septuplets, four boys and three girls. There are and there. What's that? She's beaten She's beaten up. Up. One just had nine. In Mali. Oh, someone had nine. That's, that's why I say these might not be up to date, but <laughs> someone had nine in Mali. Oh, I didn't hear about that one. Um, there are an estimated 85.4 million mothers in the United States. Like I said, I don't know how old these statistics are. I mean, these statistics could be 15 years old. I, I have no idea. Um, but uh, I just wanted something interesting to start the message with. Uh, <clears throat> um, the shortest interval between two births is 208 days or six and a half months. Jane Bleakley gave birth to a son on September 3rd, 1999. She later gave birth to a daughter on March 30th, 2000. Now, maybe that's been beaten. I'm not sure. That'd be a hard one to beat, but uh, possible, I guess. Six and a half months. Six and a half months. There are about two billion moms in the world. There are about 122.5 million phone calls on Mother's Day, making it one of the busiest phone days of the year. Uh, the average age of new moms in the U.S. today is 25 years old versus 21 years old in 1970. Modern moms in the U.S. have an average of two kids. In the 1950s, they had an average of three and a half children. Um, what was going on in the 1950s that they were giving birth to half children? You know? <laughs> they round, uh, in, the, in the 1700s, they had seven to ten kids. So... Uh, that's the other thing. You don't know how many made it to adulthood, but that's as far as children. Yes. Yeah. The lifespan is being shorter. On average, moms take two minutes, five seconds to change a diaper, which is equivalent to about three 40 hour work weeks each year for each diaper. Uh, and I'm getting, you know, a lot of that depends also on the age of the child. Because when you've got a young, the younger the child is, you're going to be changing more often, I think. Uh, especially newborns, they just, they, they, they have no uh, comprehension of conservation. And uh, as a matter of fact, the cleaner it is, the better target it is. So, um, isn't that right? Uh, is that our experience? Yes. Yep. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I've, and I've said to my wife a number of times, I said, I, I wish I would have been keeping track of how many diapers we've bought in the last, since 2000, uh, 2009, when Josiah was born. How many diapers have we bought? When you think about one case of diapers is, you know, you get 100 or, you know, the, young, the smaller ones, you can get the biggest case almost has 200 in it. And when you buy, have bought many, many. I mean, how many thousands of diapers is that? So, uh, but anyway, the uh, moms take... Oh, fathers take an average of one minute, 36 seconds. More experience. <laughs> I, was thinking, I was thinking they just don't get them as clean, probably, but, uh, you know. Yeah, just, yeah, let's just do it quick. Let's get it done. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> um, Mothers do about 88% of the laundry in the U.S. This equals 330 loads of laundry and 5,300 articles of clothing per year. The least favorite job for moms is vacuuming the stairs, according to this. Uh, there'd probably be a variety of opinions. Um, but uh, the mom with the most kids is Mrs. Fyodor uh, Vasilev of Russia. She gave birth to 69 children between 1725 and 1765. The mother who gave birth to the heaviest baby was Carmelina Fidel of Italy. In 1955, her newborn weighed 22 pounds, 8 ounces. <laughs> the, uh, uh, the first Mother's Day was on May 10, 1908. It was founded by Anna Jarvis. Woodrow Wilson made it a national holiday in 1914. Jarvis would later lament the commercialization of the holiday and sought to remove it from the calendar. Mother's Day in the U.S. falls on the second Sunday in May. Even though motherhood is becoming less popular, a majority of women still become mothers. 
Modern moms are more likely to be more educated, single, and older. There are about 152 million, and that's part of the reason why also the, uh, one of the reasons, not the only reason why the birth rate has gone down because women are waiting longer to have children. There are about 152 million Mother's Day cards sent each year. In 1872, Julia Ward Howe, a pacifist, suffragette, and the author of the Battle Hymn of the Republic was the first to suggest Mother's Day in the U.S. She hoped mothers could rally together to promote peace after the Civil War. The month when the most babies are born in the U.S. is August, and the day when most are born is Tuesday. In Utah and Alaska, women on average will have three children. The average in the U.S. is two. Uh, The U.S. National Restaurant Association reports that Mother's Day is the year's most popular holiday for eating out. Anybody going to eat out for Mother's Day? Yeah, yeah, there's not too many, but a couple of them. Um, All right, so it is is a popular uh, eating out holiday. So those are some some facts about Mother's Day, whether they're outdated or not, but um, uh, some some interesting things there. But let's get back to Psalm 127 and three three reasons why uh, motherhood is a blessing. Motherhood is a blessing. Number one, motherhood is a blessing because children are a blessing. So if you have the privilege of giving birth to a child and raising a child, that child is a blessing, and therefore you you being the mother is a blessing. Now, we don't always know, most of the time we don't, why God gives many children to some and fewer to others. So this is not a matter of comparison. Well, you know, I had only one or two, you know, somebody else had five or six or seven. Uh, And then there's some who haven't had children at all. Uh, This could be physical reasons. It could be various reasons why that's the case. But regardless of that, children should be looked at as a blessing and not a burden, even though they involve much work and a great deal of commitment in order to do things right. Um, it is, it's, um, and, and oftentimes, some of the greatest blessings involve the most work and the greatest burdens because of, um, I mean, it's, if it, in other words, if it's something that's very important, it's worthwhile for you to put the extra effort and commitment into it because of, uh, of just, just how important it is. And, and think about this. If you're, you're a mother or forefather, for that matter, you're dealing with you've brought a human life into the world. I mean, how important is that? How important is that? That's tremendously important. You brought a human life into the world. So I don't know, can you think of just about anything that's more important that you can put your mind to and put your commitment to? Obviously, our first thing is we ourselves, whether you're mother or a father, uh, need to have your first priority to walk with God, to be, first of all be saved, be a Christian, and then walk with God. And that way then you're, you'll give your kids a better chance that you can then teach them the ways of the Lord. But as far as the responsibilities in life, you know, there's really uh, what would be more important than being able to have uh, a, a, such a, a hand in actually being a steward. And by the way, they're, they're ours, but they're not ours. Now, the, 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 worldly, the worldly humanists want to say they belong to society. You know, oh, it takes a village. It takes, you know, they belong to everybody. They belong to, no, no, they belong to God, actually. We're, if God has given you children, no matter how old your children are, if God's given you children, he's entrusted you as a steward of, they're not just yours as far as your ownership. It's, it's, it's there for you to, uh, they're entrusted to you to be a good steward of what you've uh, been given. And um, so just as you might have some goods, some material things, uh, you might have, uh, there are other things that you, intr- you you've, oh, I, I put great effort, go, go to great lengths to take care of what I have. Well, then look at your children the same way. And by the way, even if you have adult children, look at them the same way because you can still steward, do, do your best to steward a good relationship uh, with your children even if uh, you're past those child raising years. But, you know, a lot of times, um, a, a, a motherhood or children are viewed more as a burden. And, and because in the moment, there's times they feel like a burden. I mean, it's, yes, physically speaking, it's a lot easier to do things in life if you don't have little ones that you got to look after and that they're not getting into things and uh, causing all kinds of other, you know, disrupting your flow of what you want to do. 
you know, when, you, uh, when people are newly married uh, and they don't have children yet, you do have a lot more flexibility of things you can do in life. And so sometimes people get so self-centered that then they sacrifice what God has for them and what God intends to be a blessing because, well, it's all about me and what I want. And in reality, we should look at children as a blessing, even though they're a lot of work, a lot of commitment. I will also say I've met some people who having children is such an idol to them that they're willing to actually commit sinful things, do sinful things to have children. I've met people like that and say, no, no, it doesn't make it right, even if you have a good intention, because then it really still comes back to, here's what I want. And uh, that doesn't make it right either. God has an order set up that he wants things to be done, and he wants people to have a stable, faithful, committed marriage. And then he want, then within that marriage, it's in, they're intended to uh, be children. But not to go out and commit fornicate. Oh, I just want to have children, so I'm just so... I've, I've met people like I don't know how many there are, but I've met people like that. And uh, it didn't it just causes problems. Um, look at verse 3 again. Lo, children are in heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is what? His reward. There's, there, it's, it, it's, God has given a reward. Here's a blessing to you. Here's something I'm passing on to you. Whether it's one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, there's people who haven't been able to have children and they, then they adopt and I realize it's not the same as, as giving birth. But you know what? Even adoption is a special thing because you're entrusted with the care of a human life. My parents had three children. I was the oldest. I am the oldest. Uh, and then um, I guess they, they were uh, in some ways didn't want to be done having ch children in the house. <laughs> So they, when I was about college age, uh, they did adopt a child, and she's now, what is she, 17? Did she turn eight? She's turning 18 this month. I mean, that's crazy. That's, that's amazing. That's amazing. But they adopted her when she was what, about two, I believe. She was three when she was adopted. And, um, and, and so there are ways in which, okay, I, I, that, that even adopted children deserve just as much of, a, of an in stewardship and care as, uh, as a natural born, as, as your own uh, biological child. And by the way, uh, my adopted sister, I don't even, half the time, the only time I think about her being adopted is when I'm telling people that she's adopted. That's the only time I think about her being adopted. Other than that, she, she seems like just as much my sister as my two biological sisters. And so there's that, uh, there's the blessing of, especially children who need to be taken care of. Maybe they're, they're biological parents were on drugs or had problems and they weren't able to take care, had, uh, were not in a position to do that, um, then praise the Lord for those people who do step in and say, we want to give this child a home. It's a big undertaking. It's a big commitment, too, uh, is, of adoption. Huge, huge commitment. Then verse 4, it says, And as arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Now, I heard uh, a preacher say one time, a pastor somewhere say one time, um, that uh, you know, and this, this person had a whole bunch of children, I think even more than my wife and I do. And, uh, and I heard him say, well, you know, someone thinks, well, you shouldn't have had so many children. Why do you keep having children? He says, well, which one of these children shouldn't I have had? Like, which one of these was a mistake? Which one of these was not, uh, which one of these should not be here right now? <laughs> no, the whole idea is, and, and yes, it's, um, there, it's important if you're going to be a good steward of the children God has given you. Um, you know, my wife and I, the, the more children we've had, we thought, I think we're getting to the point where probably God's not going to give us anymore because he wants us to be able to take care of what we have. Because <laughs> you've got to be able to take care of what you have. But the fact is, in today's materialistic, self-centered culture and career-driven culture, that's a lot of the reason why people don't have more children because why, they just have too many other things going on in life. And let me tell you, it's a ton of work when you have a lot of children. It's a lot of work when you have one or two children. But let me just tell you, the... The, the multiplication factor goes up when you add each one um, and uh, as far as the uh, work that is involved. But what are arrows uh, uh, intended for? Now, I know it realize it says happy is the man and 
uh, as, as arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that this quiver full. And, but, you know, if it's happy is the man, maybe it's because the man didn't have to give birth to all of them, but uh, that's a blessing. And, but at the same time, for the mothers, wait a minute, you're part of that unit. You're part of that family. You're part of that uh, whole, whole uh, scenario there of, yeah, the man's got his quiver full of them, but that he needed a wife to, uh, to complete that. And so what do you do with arrows? Well, you shoot them out. You shoot them out. And that's a good way to look at parenthood, but motherhood, but, or even being a father, is especially for those of you who have young children, or maybe some of you in this room will someday in the future have young children, um, view your children as arrows that you are taking care of, you're preparing, you're hanging on to, you have a quiver full of them, and doesn't say the size of the, you know, we don't, you might have a, a few, some, a little, a lot, but uh, you have your arrows, you're, you're taking care of them, and at the right time, you then shoot them out into the world. That's the way parenthood should be looked at. I, am, I, I have this stewardship here in my home. And by the way, it's the, parent, the, the one whose job it is to teach the children the most. The primary responsibility of teaching children is the parents. And so don't be surprised when the more exposure they have and the more teaching they have from secular humanistic philosophy earlier in life that they grow up with to reflect that secular humanist philosophy. And uh, it is the parent's responsibility. And it's hard to compete with the world and the, with the world, the permeation in the, of the world into them, which is why the parents need to take the lead on that. And so... Parents should prayerfully, prayerfully um, look at, okay, how do our children get educated? What's the best, what's the best way they're going to get educated? My wife and I homeschool our children. Of course, we're, we're not here to make your decisions for you. So wherever you've had your children, wherever they are, uh, that's up to you between you and the Lord. But, um, you know, it's a lot less work uh, if you send them to school. <laughs> it's a lot less work for the parents. Um, but we believe in strongly so much that we want to give them a solid, thoroughly rounded education that is biblical from a biblical perspective that we're going to take that extra time and effort and work uh, to get it done. And most of it's on my wife. I just don't have as much time for it anymore, but I still try to keep a hand in it. Um, but we believe it's that important. And by the way, somehow... I don't know how, but we can get away with spending a lot less money than the government does on educating children. I'm not sure how that works, but um, government spends a lot of money to educate children. If, if they're, and, um, and they always want more. So they always want more. They always want more money. And, and those of us that just keep our children at home, we just say, we just want more freedom. <laughs> we're not asking for money. We're just saying for freedom. Leave us alone. Let, let us, let, we're, we're giving them a good education. Um, but... Uh, and you know, we haven't had uh, any issues other than their kind of intrusive uh, registration form for homeschooling your child, which is not legal, but uh, that's a whole other story. Um, but uh, anyway, so in other words, just take the responsibility. If you have children in the home, take the responsibility for the education of your children, or if you will have children in the home someday, take the responsibility no matter where they get their grade school education, I'm just saying, just saying, telling you what we do. And, and especially we're living in a day where, de I shouldn't say desperate times, but perilous times call for very serious measures when it comes to what we do and answer to those times. And the philosophy of the world is getting, has gotten so bad and so, so pervasive in the, the, the secular systems that Christians need to take a long, hard look at what are my children being taught and do I really want them to be taught this stuff? 
Does, if it flies in the face of what I want to teach them in the home, why would I, why would I willingly send them to do that? Anyway, I'm kind of getting off, on tra- off track here, but just think about that. Because it's not getting any better. It's getting a lot worse. It's getting a lot worse in America as far as the, the schooling, uh, the education, the philosophy of education. And we're seeing the fruits of it in our society. We're going to continue to see the fruits of it. Um, so arrows are intended to be shot to some distant location. And we don't know where that's going to be for children. You don't know where they're going to end up. All I, all I know is, as a parent, all we can do is we can prepare them the best we can with the leadership of the Lord, the grace of God, and then trust that as we then shoot them out, there's going to be that time. They just go out and God will do something with their lives. And trust them to the Lord's direction, leading, and grace. Now, being a mother is one of the hardest responsibilities in existence. It really is. It really is. It's one of the hardest responsibilities because, um, you know, just giving birth is the start. <laughs> it's hard enough to give birth. But then you're, then you're committing yourself to years of training, raising children, Taking, having to care for them before yourself. You know, that can be hard for a mother and it can be wearing and, and it involves a lot of self-denial, humility. Motherhood is a blessing because children are a blessing. And, and Jesus had a favorable attitude toward children. Let the little children come unto me. Forbid them not for such, the, uh, king, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, uh, God told the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, he said they need to teach their children and their children's children. That, it would, that was, that was a, one of the top priorities that they had was to be teaching their children and their grandchildren the things of God. Number two, motherhood is a blessing because it was designed by God. It was designed by God. Turn to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16. Genesis 3 and verse 16. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. This was a consequence to the woman's being deceived, eating the fruit of the knowledge of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And but the consequence was, in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. But it was still God's design that the women were going to bring forth children. So, the, 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 so being a mother is, was designed by God. And, you know, motherhood, I was thinking of this, uh, kind of read some things that reminded me of this. The motherhood is so important that it's actually, the devil has actually found ways to counterfeit it. Because you have these mystery religions, these pagan religions where they have their goddesses and, the, and then there's the Mother Gaia and the you know, Mother Earth. And, and so there's a counterfeit to show, oh, wow, look at the importance of, oh, we have Mother Earth. And, uh, and then there's the pagan religions that had goddesses and, uh, and, and those types of things that really take the focus off of motherhood according to the Bible. And... Not only is motherhood, uh, 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 the motherhood was designed by God, turned to, or looked down at verse 20, and, Eve call, and Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Wow, what a, what a privilege. She was the mother of all living. But God designed it that way. God designed it that way. And by, so, by the way, she was the mother of all living. It's not Mother Earth. It's not goddess worship. It's, there's a creator God who created the heaven and the earth. He created male and female and then created from there the reproduction, multiplication. Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. So um, for those of you who had some unpleasant uh, labors and deliveries, you can blame Eve for that and just say, why did did you have to give in to that serpent? Why did you have to give in to that serpent? Why couldn't you just have not been deceived? But that was, that, was a con- that was her consequence. There was a consequence to the serpent. There was a consequence to the woman. There was a consequence to the man. They all had their equal consequences as far as they were all viewed as being responsible as part of this. 
But that was for the woman. Motherhood is a blessing because it was designed by God, and, and motherhood is important to God because God used a mother to bring the Savior into the world. But here's the problem. Here's the counterfeit is we don't worship Mary as some goddess. That's tied in with pagan religion. It's simply Mary was a servant of the Lord who God chose to use to bring the Savior into the world. Look at Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. And so there you see about the seed of the woman and how that goes on down through the, through the years and, and eventually uh, we come to Jesus Christ and humanly speaking. Turn to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1 and verse 26. Luke chapter 1 and verse 26. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph to the house of, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. And so what a, this was God's favor being shown to Mary, that she would become a mother, and not just a mother, but a mother of the Savior, a mother of the Messiah. What a blessing. So motherhood was designed by God, and God used motherhood to bring the Savior into the world. And look down at verse 39. And Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb. There's a good um, anti-abortion principles here in this passage, by the way. The babe leaped in her womb. Oh, oh the, you mean the baby could hear something? In the womb? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost, and she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe, in my, uh, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. And... I like, I like just this, the wording of this. I'll just read the next two verses. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced, oh, in God my Savior. Wow. Mary's not a co-redemptrix. Mary was simply used by the Savior, by God her Savior, to bring the Savior, humanly speaking, into the world. And what a blessing that there is. There was a performance. There shall be a performance of those things which are told her from the Lord. Motherhood is a blessing because it was designed by God and he used a mother to bring the Savior into the world. John 16, 21 says, A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. And there's all that build up. There's all that building up to that moment. And it just, you can't take it anymore. And then finally the baby comes and what a relief. What a relief. And then what joy. Oh, wait. Oh, boy. There's that baby. It was actually worth it to bring a child into the world. Despite the difficulty. Motherhood is a blessing because it was designed by God. Uh, number three, motherhood is a blessing because it helps women stay focused on doing what is good and most important. Motherhood helps women stay focused on doing what is good and most important. First Timothy chapter five, first Timothy chapter five. And I go back to that most important because 
there is the philosophy, there's the mentality that, you know, there are just other things that are more important than having children in your life. Well, yeah, you need to have a good marriage if you're married and um, should place a high priority on a relationship with God and pleasing the Lord, serving the Lord. But 1 Timothy chapter 5, and probably for... I'm just going to read through, but I'm not going to be able to delve into uh, all these verses. And that the whole point is not these, all of these verses, but just a couple of them. Uh, chapter 5 and verse 1, 1 Timothy, Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren, the elder women as mothers, the younger as sisters, with all purity. Honor widows that are widows indeed, but if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and to requite their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. So this passage is primarily referring to how you deal with widows in the church. Uh, and if they're younger, or, they have, or if, even if they're older, if they have children, they have family there, can take care of them. The first priority should be their family should take care of them. Now that she is a widow indeed and desolate, trusteth in God... And continueth in supplications and prayers night and day, but she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. And these things give in charge that they may be blameless. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Now here we have talking about providing for those widows, providing for his family. But it just this comes back to, um, I'm going to deviate just a moment here. There are tons of jobs available. Tons of jobs available. I'm reading, I'm reading these news reports about how there are places they just need workers. They just need workers. Now, I realize some people might be fearful of, of the coronavirus, but there's a lot of men out there who could be looking for a job and could be getting a job who don't get a job. There are factories that need workers. There's places there's shortages of materials. I mean, I realize some of it's raw material shortages, but some of it's just they can't, they don't have enough workers to produce stuff fast enough. And, and I think about what the Bible says about work and what a man's responsibility is. And if there's a man who's there just content to sit there collecting unemployment and these, you know, all that free money the government was handing out, I realize there may have been a time where some people were kicked out of their jobs because of coronavirus. The time has come and gone now. It's time to get back to work. It's time to look for a job. If, if you don't have a job, if you're a man, you don't have a job, get a job. There are places hiring. I was, I, I, so I decided I'm just going to type in, I'm going to do Indeed, and I'm going to do uh, Greenfield, Massachusetts. And I was, wow, yeah, there's quite a few jobs available. Very, various kinds of jobs. And that was just that one site. And I see about this, providing not for his own, especially for his own house. Um, if a man doesn't work, neither should he eat. You know, it's time to get back to work. Um, I don't know if there's anybody in here like that, but I'm just saying, I just wanted to say that. Just wanted to say that. It's time to get back to work, okay? Um, and, you know, not all jobs are the same either. There are some jobs that are just more productive than others. You're actually making more of a difference than others. And so um, look for, you know, get a job. Now, first of all, get a job. But then also, if you have the opportunity, get a job that gives, gives greater meaning and of greater impact in people's lives. So considering that, I, I guess if you're at Dunkin' Donuts, if you're at Dunkin' Donuts, Dunkin' Donuts holds a near and dear place in the hearts of many people in this region of the country. And so you're meeting an emotional need, a mental need by providing that. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, someone, someone had a vanilla bean culotta at work yesterday. I said, oh, I said, what is that? And I thought it was a culotta. She said, oh, it's a vanilla bean culotta. I said, oh, boy, that's Sugar Rush Central. I said, I can't drink that. <laughs> um, but anyway, I just wanted to, I wanted to pick on Dunkin' Donuts guy there. Um, but uh, so anyway, what I'm saying is, though, it's time to get, the point is he got to work. He got a job. He got a job. He got a job. He's got a job. Russ kind of has a job. No, he's not. <laughs> he, no, he wants to work. Russ likes to work. Russ is a worker. But the point is, we should be, it's, it, 
not only is motherhood a blessing, but being able to actually physically work is a blessing. And I realize there's some people who have literally physical disabilities that prevent them from doing certain things, but um, it's time to get back to work if you're not back to work. Uh, and, and you should be back to work. If, if you should be back to work, it's time to get back to work. Now, if you're a mother taking care of children at home, you don't have to get back to work because uh, <laughs> you already got back to work. You're, you've already, your work never ended. Um, Where am I here? Oh, let's continue reading here. Verse 9, Let not a widow be taken into the number under threescore years old, having been the wife of one man, well reported of for good works. If she have brought up children, if she have lodged strangers, if she have washed the saints' feet, if she has relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. Uh, so qu criteria for who the church takes care of as far as widows being concerned. But if, if you've got family, then the family should be taking care of them as well. Now, I realize in our culture today, you know, in, our, in our governmental systems, we have, there are a lot of other ways in which people get taken care of. But, you know, before the days of Social Security, it was up to the families and it was up to the churches. They would take care of people. And I realize so the way things are structurally, it's, it's different. Um, where, you know, instead of uh, having a widow's fund where you put you know, a chunk of your income in there for the church to, to help the widows, it's now you pay it into the Social Security Fund. <laughs> um, but uh, the whole point is, no matter what the structure is in our society, we should have the right heart and the right priority and perspective that we have these opportunities. We should be doing them. We should be following God's uh, order here. Um, thank you says, but the younger widows refuse, for when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. And with all they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also in busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. So what he's saying here is, if, you, if the church ends up taking care of the younger widows, they're going to get lazy, they're going to have too much time on their hands, and then they're going to be a busybody, and they're going to um, the bad things are going to happen. They're going to be a bad testimony. There's just, just, it's not, good's not going to come out of it. They, here's what he says. I will therefore, then he's talking about the younger widows here. The younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Now, this is the will for widows in the context here, but we can learn, take the principles of this and understand that's what that's better for younger women to marry than to wander from house to house being busybodies, even if they're not married. Now, Paul said elsewhere in 1 Corinthians that, you know, if it, that singlehood is actually a blessing. If, if, if God hasn't brought someone into your life that you know you're supposed to marry, take advantage of the time of being single. Because then you actually have more flexibility to serve the Lord in various ways. So here it's not saying, oh, you just got to marry at all costs if you're a younger woman. Oh, I got to get married at all costs because it says here. No, it needs to be what God's order and design and timing is for your life. The, whether you're single or whether you're married, the first priority should be serving the Lord and doing his will. Whether it's his will in the singlehood or his will in the marriage. But here's what I will the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproach, reproachfully. For some are already turned aside after Satan. Now, why does that, now, how does that work? Well, it's because they're too busy to get into other trouble. <laughs> too busy to get involved in other stuff. Focus on the children. Oh, I got to raise the children. I got to take care of the children. I got to guide the house. And the last time I checked, from, from, and this is from a guy's point of view, but Having someone guiding the house is really important because I'm not there most of the time. I'm not there during the week. I'm at where I'm. Do so the fact that my wife's there and I'm, I'm leading somewhere with this here as we wrap this up. We're going to go to one more passage in just a moment. But for some are already turned aside after Satan. Now, here's the here's the real sad thing. Actually, let me back up. How many how many of you have known someone, a, a younger woman? who they kind of lived wild and wicked and sinful. And then all of a sudden they had a child and they kind of got a bit more settled in their life. Anybody know anybody like that? I've seen it happen a bit. And that's, that's a good thing for them. What's really sad is they have the child 
and then they still go out and live a wicked, wild life. I mean, because God's put them in the perfect position. You can focus, take care of someone else. And where does that come back to? It comes back to pride and it comes back to self-centeredness. Oh, it's all about me and my pleasure. But God puts, God uh, uh, gives that opportunity to some people saying, all right, well, here's, here's, you're going to go out and live promiscuously and you're going to do these things. Well, you might just have a child along the way that might settle you down a bit. It's better just to do things in God's way anyway is to live a chaste, pure life for God, committed to the Lord. Let him bring that spouse into your life and do things his way. And, oh, life's a whole lot better that way. Life's a whole lot better that way. Uh, turn to Titus chapter 2. One more passage here, Titus chapter 2. And verse 1, but speak thou, it's just a couple, few pages away. Titus 2 and verse 1 just after 2 Timothy. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. You, you, you can tell a society that's really in rebellion against God when even the older women are foul-mouthed and live wickedly and have dirty minds and just... That's, that's a, that's a, it's one thing you think, oh, yeah, younger people, oh, yeah, that's the way younger people are. I've seen a lot of older people just with foul mouths and just dirty minds and, and the stuff that they do. And, the, and, and they, maybe on the outside they look like, oh, yeah, they look fairly normal. And then you find out what's inside of them and you think, oh, my goodness. Wait a minute, I thought when you got older you got a little wiser and more mature and a little more <laughs> common sense. But some people, no, it doesn't happen. Uh, but here's what, here's, what, here's what the aged women, uh, for this is what God's will is for aged women, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Why? Because when... These things are not in place. It brings reproach upon the name of Christ and the word of God is blasphemed because it's opposite. So if someone says, oh, I'm a Christian. They go out and just live like the devil, live like the world, and they're rebellious and they're all kinds of things and they're not chaste, they're not discreet. That's a contradiction to what you say you are. Oh, I'm a Christian, but here's the way you're living. It's blaspheming the word of God in the eyes of maybe the person's husband and other people in the world. And then it goes on there for young men, likewise exhort. So what we need, we need older women who will teach the younger women what the Bible says and set a good example. And here's what I'm going to say to uh, those who maybe wonder, well, what about in today's economy where there's more women in the workplace? Well, no matter whether you're a woman in the workplace or not, the Bible is very clear of what the, what the woman's first priority is if she's married. The woman's first priority is, is as a wife and mother. Now, what that's going to look like in your life, it might be different for various people, and you might be able to work out various things. It's different things. Um, you know, and then sometimes you get, you know, what about when the children grow up and get out of the house? Your, your, your priority is still to your husband, to taking care of your home. Yeah, you might have something that you do out. You know, you might have even a career or um you know, various things you might be trained in a certain way and, and may do a very good job in it. The Bible principles here, this is your priority. Now, what that, what that looks like is between you and your spouse and God and his word. And I realize that's, that goes, that flies in the face of everything, that is, the way things operate today. But that is what the Bible says. And... Um, what we need are those older women. And by the way, if you're older, it doesn't mean you're old. It just means you're older than the younger ones. <laughs> so you might, I mean, you might be, you might be 40. And if you're teaching a 30-year-old or a 25 or 20-year-old, you're, you're not old. You're just older than them. <laughs> um, Because that's what it's, it's the aged women. And by the way, that's a nice that's a nice word, aged. 
sounds sounds very cultured and you know that that it's that it's gone well you've you've learned some things you've matured you you have wisdom to then pass on to those who are younger than you and by the way we need younger women who are actually willing then to learn those things from the older women cuz th- what they're hearing is oh yeah just go out and do what you want to do and yeah live your own life you just chart your own course and are not encouraged by the world to then learn from others, but there are some things that younger women can learn from older women, but we need the older women who are actually in place there to actually teach the right things to younger women. Now, many times the, quote, what the world would call traditional, (laughs) I call it biblical, roles of womanhood and motherhood are thought to be of lesser importance than what the man's roles are. In other words, we need a society with equality. We need equality in this society. We need women to do, be able to do everything that a man can do. Do you know what that saying is? Somehow what the Bible says a woman's roles are, the primary responsibilities are for a woman, that somehow those are of lesser importance. If, 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 uh, if the society today is saying, well, I'm now looking, I'm not content with this, what the traditional roles are. We need to do what everything that a man can do. You're actually belittling, they're belittling what God says in his word are actually very important roles of being a wife, being a mother, being a woman. And uh, because now we, oh, we, got, we just got to have what everybody else has in complete equality. God never intended for there to be complete equality and responsibilities and roles. That's not in the Bible. That's why people hate the Bible, because it goes against their humanistic thought, and their rebellious thought. There is certainly equality in worth and value of every human being. So that just saying there's not equality in roles and responsibilities does not mean that people are not equal in their worth and importance as a human. But we need to get that, distinguish that. And we've got a bunch of wicked, God-hating people who are intent on erasing the natural order. Apparently there's a term out there that's being used by certain people called birthing people birthing people. Not mothers, bir- or not women, birthing people. Why? Because if you're a woman who thinks you're a man, well, yeah, oh, you can still technically give birth, but you're a, you're a man now. You're not a woman. So you're not a woman. You're a birthing person. Let's, let's make it completely equal, no distinctions. And that is just the root of wickedness and rebellion from the devil, is that philosophy. And by the way, it's increasing it's increasing. So we better have a good grip on what it means to be a woman, it means to be a mother, the importance of that, that it is not, uh, you know, because someone heard this message and they say, oh, you're, you're part of that patriarchal problem. You know, you're part of the patriarchy because you just mentioned, oh, you know, woman has a role as a mother. And, uh, what are you, uh, misogynist or whatever the words are, you know, whatever words they come up with, you know, to no. Actually, I'm trying to elevate people to who they were meant to be in God's sight. That's really what it is. So I don't have to, have, I don't have to apologize and think, oh, you're, you're putting down women, you're women. No, I'm, if I believe well, this is God's word and he's, he's, he's created male and female, and I'm trying to teach what the Bible says, well, then I'm trying to elevate people to God's purpose and responsibility for their lives. What's wrong with that? How's that anti-woman? How's that being patriarchal? How's that being like, oh, men are up here and women are down? No, I'm trying to get everybody to where God wants them to be. But the, uh, this representative from Missouri, uh, her name's Corey Bush. I, I honestly don't, it, it's a reflection of, and honestly, it's mostly coming from these cities, from the cities, how these people get elected into office. It should be very disturbing to us, the condition of our country, and particularly certain cities. I think she's probably from the St. Louis area, would be my guess. I didn't look, but uh, um, but there are big problems there. Now, she was testifying or given a, before some committee, and she was talking about her own experiences. And I mean, if what she's saying, as far as her experience in giving birth to children, she had some really major problems as far as uh, giving birth. And, and if actually just the... the, the um, the actual pregnancy itself, I mean, just really amazing that her children even survived. But she was making it out. She was telling those stories in the context of, 
oh, this, this shows that there's systemic racism in our society. That was, so that was, that was the whole point. I'm thinking, no, it's just an interesting story. And yeah, there must have been these doctors, whoever was you know, taking care of you at the time, they apparently said some things and did some things that weren't very good. I don't know how you get complete racism out of that. Maybe there was a couple things there, but I don't know. Didn't sound to, at least from her account, but it had to be all about racism. And, but it wasn't black women, it was, or African-American women, it was birthing people. Now, she did use the term mothers and women at times, but birthing people. And now also in the uh, House of Representatives, their handbook of rules or, or whatever they're doing, they're trying to remove the gender distinctions out of that. Um, but, you know, by calling people birthing people, by calling women birthing people, that's, that's actually an insult to women and mothers. It's really an insult. Oh yeah, we're pro woman. Yeah, let's say yeah, we're 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 raising up, uh, we're raising up the standard. Oh yeah, we're we're trying to help women go forward. And there's too much discrimination and there's too much holding everybody back. Let's break that glass ceiling. But yeah, we're, we're but yet yeah, you know, sorry women, you're not the only ones who give birth anymore. Uh, there's there's birthing people out there. There's people who don't identify as a man or a woman, and there's there woman who identifies as a man. So if she says she's a man, she's a man. So but. You know, if, she, if he can still give birth, well, he's a birthing person, not a woman, not a she. You see, see how ridiculous that is and what an insult that is to the Creator. And it's an insult to the Creator and it's an insult to women everywhere. <laughs> it's an insult to women. It's not empowering women, it's an insult. The best thing you can do to be empowered is to be empowered. The best way you're empowered is when you are empowered to discover, and this is for men and women, empowered to discover God's purpose and role for your life and then do what God says in his word. That's the ultimate empowerment. That's the ultimate empowerment is be the woman God created you to be, be the mother God wants you to be, be the wife God wants you to be, and then for men, be the man God wants you to be. And you don't need to get confused as to who you are. If you're confused, get into the Bible, find out. You'll, God will show you who you are. <laughs> this is the result of rebelling against God's order is hardness, misery, and confusion. You know, with all this women empowerment going on, I would think there'd be a lot happier women out there, but there's a lot of miserable, wretched, I mean, hardened women out there. <laughs> I would think, boy, wouldn't we be having a, wouldn't women be much happier now? I mean, they've got more opportunities than they've had before in our society. Oh, no, 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 no. That's not the way it is. Oh, they're just, they're just, not everybody, of course, but um, there's a lot, of, a lot of hardened people out there, a lot of hardened women out there. You know, it's because ultimate fulfillment comes when you are fulfilling the will of the Lord. That's what brings the greatest joy is fulfilling the will of the Lord. And so we need both uh, this for you today, if you're a mother or if you will be a mother someday, uh, for those of us who have never been and never will be mothers, um, maybe those of you who have been mothers, but your children are out of the house. It's a challenge to us as well to hold the line and hold ground, hold fast on what the Bible says, because we're facing increased opposition of that in the society and the culture in which we live. And by the way, if someone's confused as to whether or not they're a man or a woman, they do need compassion. They need some help. They need some guidance. I'm not talking about ostracizing or making fun of people. I'm talking about Yes, we need to lovingly, meekly, humbly help people if they're willing to receive help. So I'm not talking about making fun, not talking about, uh, but I'm just saying people need help. It's not right. But we have this culture that's encouraging it, so it makes it that much harder because it's being accepted, widely accepted in our culture. And maybe today you're not even saved. Maybe you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. So that, that's God's first purpose for your life is you need to have your sins forgiven. You need to have eternal life. You need to trust Christ as your Savior have eternal life, and then from there you can go on and be the person God wants you to be, putting Him first, giving Him glory. Thank God for mothers. Motherhood is a blessing. Thank you to the mothers here who have sacrificed through the years. And I realize, I realize there's maybe bro a lot of brokenhearted mothers because things don't always turn out the way that you were hoping and maybe things went a different direction than what you would have loved to see. But you know what? Today I just want to say motherhood is a blessing. And uh, 
So thank the Lord for you. And uh, let's, uh, let's show some honor to our mothers. Today. You should honor your father and mother any time of year. But uh, today's a good reminder, uh, the blessing of motherhood.